Hello. 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 Good. Is anyone feeling sleepy like me? <laughs> so, like you heard my friends, Kenneth Lincoln. And it's a pleasure to be here with you tonight. I guess it's the first time I'm here. So, I may not know any name apart from mine. But we'll see how it goes. So we are going to talk about God the Father and the Holy Spirit. But I, looking at your schedule, I saw that you already spoke about Jesus Christ. It's quite Actually, easy. We did. <laughs> we had to move that around. So some might do our, um, discovering Christ. We're going to do who's Jesus is. Okay. But that's quite easy. Everyone knows Jesus Christ. <laughs> <laughs> so we should not worry about that, right? But to talk about God the Father and the Holy Spirit, it's impossible not to talk about Jesus Christ. Even though we'll be teaching a Binitarian Christology, Trinity. And when we talk of Trinity, we are talking of three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And so although we're focusing on Father and Holy Spirit, it will be good to make it clear that there is Son somewhere between Father and Holy Spirit, so that we have that complete picture, right? of what we mean by the Trinity. So the Trinity, like the name three, means three persons in one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And um, it's so confusing, right, to say three persons in one God, three in one. Think of uh, the sacrament of marriage, where we say two become one. Think of God. Three persons in one God. The f there is one God. So which means the Father is God. The Son, Jesus Christ, He is God. And the Holy Spirit, the Sanctifier, is God as well. So which means in the three persons in one God, there, there are rules. The Father is the Creator. The Son is the Redeemer. And then the Holy Spirit is the Sanctifier. Three things, Creator, Redeemer, and Sanctifier. So when we talk of the Trinity, these are three persons equal in majesty and whatever you can think of the big words, right? Like the big, big words, the high words. But uh, there are three persons in one God. So let us think of God the Father. God the Father. And the first words we can think of is Matthew chapter 23, verse 9, when Jesus says, call no one father. Why did you call me father? So why did you call me father? Out of respect for your title. All right, title. It's a good question. It's a good answer. Do we have any thoughts? Why do you call people father? Why do you call people mothers? Let's not only talk about father. Mothers as well. What do you think? There's no wrong answer, so no wrong answer. Because they created you. Perfect. What else? Their title, role in your life. Title and role, yes. What else? You also care for us spiritually. Care for us spiritually, yes. What else? Um, they watch over you. They watch over you. Good. They guide you. They guide you. They guide you. Great. Yes. So when you call someone father, mother, it's a title, but much more it becomes a nature, right? You assume a nature which you become. So not calling that person that name is a negation of who that person is, right? Not calling God father is a negation of his nature. Not calling Mary mother is a negation of our nature. Not calling your parents father and mother is a negation of the nature which they have assumed, right? So when we call God father, it is not to walk on so much either patriarchal lines or to think so much of um, being chauvinistic, but it's so much of a nature that those people have assumed. So if God by nature is Father, not calling him Father, you are going against who he is. Just like 
if I don't call Mary mother, I'm going against her nature. And if you call me father, it's not a title so much as a nature that I've assumed, which is a nature to serve. And calling you mother and you father is a nature you have assumed by virtue of what you have become by matrimony to be to yourselves and to your children. So, God as Father is a nature which we cannot take away from Him. And then John chapter 3 verse 1 says we should love the Father. The love the Father has for us. It's so great, right? And then Ephesians 4, 6 says there's one God and Father who is above all things and through all things. So we see there are already texts in Scripture talking about Father. Although we understand that uh, according to the culture, it was so much a culture to refer so much to God as Father that some people have come to think we don't think of mothers or it's a male chauvinistic culture, but it's a nature assumed that the person referred to as Father or the person referred to as mother is simply acting by that nature they have assumed, by that which they have assumed up to. So, when we talk of God, our Father, He is the first person of the Trinity. So we said the Trinity is made up of three... Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Three persons. That's the Trinity. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. That's not a good question. Sure. Before we move on. Um, <clears throat> so in non-English speaking countries, um, would you still say Son, Father, Holy Spirit, and would Father be the same thing as in English when you have Father and Father, as in like, you know, normal Father and also your title as Father? So Can you ask that again? So like, let's say in Latin, right. what is the word for your title? Father. Is it still father? Yeah. Is it English father? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, so it's a universal word. It's universal word. Okay, so regardless of the language. Oh, okay. Yeah, so pater is father. When you say they are father in Latin, pater not the, our father. So, when we talk of the father, I said the father is the creator, the son is the redeemer. He came to die. And then the Holy Spirit is the sanctifier. So the Father as the creator, he made heaven and earth. And one would probably say he's the creator of heaven and earth. Of things visible and invisible. He is the Father. And when we pray the creed, right, which we say every Sunday, we say the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, they are the same. He is consubstantial. The Holy Spirit, the Son is consubstantial with the Father. What does that word mean? Consubstantial. Just a, it's just a big word. It doesn't mean much. What any case is, if you say con, C O N, then substance. If con means with, what would that be? Together. The same substance. Consubstantial is the same substance as the Father. So although the Son appeared in time, the Son was there from the very beginning, right? It's not like the Son only came to be when He was born on Christmas Day. He has been there from the very beginning. And that's why we said that He is consubstantial with the Father. Because the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, though they came to be known at various times in history, they have been there from the very beginning. Because the Father created the Son came to redeem and to reveal to us who the Father is. And then the Holy Spirit becomes the sanctifier. So, when we think of fatherhood in our own community, in our own context, and I want us to be thinking of fatherhood and motherhood, what are some things that come to your mind? Again, there's no wrong answer. When you think of fatherhood, motherhood, what what comes to your mind? Responsibility. Responsibility. Perfect. Protectors. Protectors. Yeah. Guidance. <clears throat> Guidance. Provider. Provider. What else? 
Anything? Teacher. Disciplinary. Yeah, no. I like that one. <laughs> yes, so, all those things, that's what comes to your mind, right? And that's who they are, fathers and mothers. And when you think of <coughs> the nature of the father or the mother, let us think of uh, Luke chapter 15, the story of the prodigal son. You know, when this guy took all the money and went and had such a nice life, and then came back. And they said, I've seen against heaven and against you. It's quite easy to say, right? I no longer consider to call your son. Treat me as one of your hired workers. And then the father took him in. In the father's nature is to be merciful and forgiving despite what has gone against, what the son has done against him, rather than trying to punish him. The younger son on the other hand comes and is so hungry, you know, he feels like he's being cheated. But you see that it is just in the father's nature to be that loving and forgiving, you know, that protecting. That disciplinarian who is that kind, that gentle, whatever you think about him, all those characteristics. And then they show in who a father is. And it's the same thing we'll talk of the mother. Probably when we talk about Mary and the mother of Mary, the mother of God, we'll see the same thing as the mother. She went through everything mothers go through in, in Jesus' life. I know that Jesus was a bad boy. But everything about motherhood and fatherhood to bring up the child Jesus Christ. So if God the Father is the creator, what did we say God the Son is? Redeemer. 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 Perfect. This is the guy who was born to die, right? It was so clear. Why was he born to die? To and us. The same was perfect. By dying on the cross. And that's why we have Easter, right? Which is the greatest of all feasts, not even Christmas. Because the Son is the Redeemer whom the Father now sent because we had sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. So the Son came to reveal to us who God is, like that physical representation of the Father whom we have never seen, and then to save us from our sins. And so, we just celebrated Christmas, right? So, what are some thoughts about Christmas? What do you have? Anything. What are some thoughts about Christmas? It will just be about the sun. Anything about Christmas is about the sun, right? And who is he? He's God. So, what are some of your thoughts about the sun? That he came as a baby. As a baby. Vulnerable, right? Vulnerability. How can God come as a baby? Yes. And you can't help but love a baby. Pardon? You can't help but love a baby. You can't help but love a baby. Wow, that's a good one. Everybody. How would you hate a baby? Wasn't it right. pro prophesied as well? Yeah. Uh, in, in not only in uh, uh, religious but also scientific circles. Yeah, that, uh, a, a, a child born yes. would save uh, people. Yeah, it has been prophesied. You know, the whole, the Old Testament is like a prophecy of what has happened in the New Testament. You know, you read the prophecies. A son is going to be born. His name is going to be Emmanuel. A virgin shall be born a son. You know, all those things. Then he came to be born. And that's in the child. So it was already prophesied. But if you read the Old Testament and you remain there, do you have answers? So you have to cross to the New Testament to now say, okay, Isaiah was talking about him. Jeremiah was talking about those children who were killed, you know, doing what we call typology. You know, what is said in the Old Testament, you see now the types in the New Testament. So the New Testament becomes mostly, not to all together, like answers to some of the prophecies you see in the Old Testament. What else about this song guy? Jesus Christ. We just celebrated Christmas. <laughs> Nothing like Santa, like Santa, so what else? Born into poverty. Born into poverty, yes, you know, there's no room in the inn. Can you imagine that your father creates all this house and you have nowhere to stay? 
right? There's a funny story about uh, about uh, the story in Bethlehem being no room in the inn, actually. And the story goes thus. That when Joseph and Mary got to Bethlehem, and they went to the first room, and then the first inn, and they said, it is all occupied. They went to the second inn, they said, it is all occupied. And then Mary turned and said, Joseph, why did you not reserve the room ahead of time? <laughs> As Joseph was trying to say, Mary, Mary, I'm sorry. Silent night just started. <laughs> <laughs> so, you see, God being born into poverty, right? He, he came and did not even have a place to live in. That's God the Son, Jesus Christ. What else do we think of Christmas? Recognized by the Magi. Recognized by the Magi. As a king. As a king, yeah. You know, the gifts they brought, they say gifts of mystic meaning, right? The gifts are already foreshadowing who is going saying who is going to be. A king proclaimed, one who is going to die. Very symbolic. And he's God, right? God the Father and God the Son. What else? Rebirth and restoration. Rebirth and restoration. All was lost. All seemed so grim and gloomy, right? Then this guy came and then brought life. He brought life again. Rebirth. Rejuvenation. That's what he did. God the Son. What else? There's angels involved. Angels. 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 Wow, the stars. Angels. Anything about angels? Who? Singing to the shepherds. Singing to the shepherds. Singing. You know, angels singing glory to God in the highest. You know, it was not just any kind of natural birth, right? How many birthdays are celebrated in the church? How many? One. Who? Jesus. Jesus. John the Baptist. John the Baptist. Mary. Three. So it's a big deal. It's a big deal. And Jesus is God. Angels are singing. You know, angels are singing and praising God, saying that something great has happened. He is God the Son. God the Son. What else? Well, yes. I, was, I remember I read something about how the, the manger, there's a significance to the fact that he was put in a manger. Mm -hmm. Because when lambs are put in mangers, there's some aspect of like, uh, I don't have it exactly, but when the shepherds were told that he was put in a manger, they already knew what that meant. Because like, like when a lamb is put there, it, it doesn't really, it's not really what we see in the church, what we use like hay and stuff. It's for like uh, the innocent, like a very innocent, um, self-proclaimed lamb. It's not. I'm not. Sh I don't have the exact mm -hmm. description, but for, right. from what I understand, it was it's a, it's a type of lamb that you put in a manger. So that's how the shepherds knew because Jesus was put into that <coughs> that this was a special uh, type of baby. This is a special baby. This is not just any baby. Perfect. I probably butchered that, but just hopefully you follow it. Sounds somewhere. <laughs> and then he came to say, Behold the Lamb of God. You remember John, who takes away the sins of the world, right? He came as a lamb. He came where sh animals were being fed, and he became that shepherd, and eventually became the lamb, right? Going back to the way he came, and it actually what he says. What you said, it ties to what you actually said. That's who it was. What else about Christmas? So much about this Christmas. The, the ruler at the time, King Herod, uh, killed off a bunch of uh, babies. Yeah, the whole innocence. You know, Herod, you know, there's always a little bit of politics in everything, right? Mm. <laughs> Let's do it. Politics. Herod is thinking, oh, this guy, they have been saying a king is born, it means my power is threatened. What can I do? He comes up with a lofty plan. All babies two years and younger, we are going to kill them. Statistics actually say some people think there were like 14,000 babies. Some people think there were like 64,000 babies. Some people think, no, Bethlehem was a very small place, maybe like six to eight babies. But, you know, he, he kills all these babies just to be sure that that guy called Jesus Christ is dead so that his power can 
be secured, right? Because Jesus Christ is God. And he was looking at it from the perspective of human authority. But Jesus Christ would say, my authority is not of this world. My authority is not of this world. So that's God the Son. The one who is sent by the Father, born to die, evangelizes, and then dies. That's God the Son. And he is consubstantial with the Father. Any questions so far? How could I say a natural conception as well? Pardon? A natural conception? The fact that Mary was a virgin Mary. Like a yes, the natural conception actually that Mary was conceived without original sin. So in the Maculate Conception, it's not about the conception of Jesus Christ, but it's about Mary being already prepared for the role she was going to do. Yeah. Also, Mary and Joseph were technically migrants who were taken in by the inn owner and his wife, even a refuge. So had it not been because of that, right? obviously, of course, this thing would have been different. Absolutely. Perfect. Good insights. You had a question? Yeah. Um, so he refers to, as, as an adult, he refers to my father, my father, you know, mm -hmm. I come from my father and stuff like that. So he's, he's referring to himself, though, in that regard. Right. Because he is, he is the father, he is the son, he is the Holy Spirit, mm -hmm. all in one. Um, so why, I guess, why does he choose to, to phrase it like that instead of, uh, this is what this is what I teach you. This is what I do for you. Kind of taken that be like I am God, mm -hmm. as opposed to saying no, my Father is God. I'm just I'm I'm just telling you what my Father is saying. Right. So I don't know. Do you have any insight on that? So we know the Father through the Son. Yeah. Of course, we will have had maybe some knowledge of revelation, some input about who the Father is. Mm -hmm. When the Jesus Christ came and then he actually showed us who the Father could be. Mm -hmm. By the way, he referred to him, my Father and I are one. You know, so we are able now to see that there is a distinction which is not so much a differentiation. Mm -hmm. That there is a Father who is a Creator, a Son who is a Redeemer, and then the Holy Spirit who is a Sanctifier. And uh, had it been Adam and Eve did not fall, probably the sun would not have come. Mm -hmm. But does it mean the sun does not exist? No. But now the sun came and made us to know the father better, better mm -hmm. because he referred to him as his father. And in several instances, we, we got a glimpse of who the father could be because of who the son is. So in referring to him as father, he doesn't diminish his authority as the Son, who is God as well, but he's actually revealed to us who the Father can be more better. So it's easier to relate people to the Father figure as opposed to saying, I'm God, right. I'm the one that's going to help you, instead of, you know, uh, so, okay, I understand. <laughs> yeah. Any other question? before we do the Holy Spirit. Any other question? I was thinking about how, like, you know, we think about God and how enormous and like, incomprehensible God is from our own human perspective. And, you know, Chris and I were talking and, uh, about how Jesus is God coming down to earth almost to, like, experience it for himself, you know, and that in experiencing that, you know, maybe even then, has more compassion for the human condition and how difficult it is. And if Jesus is here, who is God, you know, it's certainly not like God isn't still also being God. So it's almost, you know, it's like... Omnipresence. Yeah, omnipresence. It's not like the omnipresence vanishes from the universe somehow just to become into a, a human. So it is the paradox that we are talking about here, like where it's almost like an aspect of God right. becomes Jesus. You know, Absolutely. He took our own... Flesh. He took human form, right? Mm -hmm. So he actually experienced that which we do. He, he goes through emotions like us. The only thing he did not do is that he did not sin. No, he was man in every way but sin. 
and St. Paul tells us that, right? I think it's Philippians. So, that aspect of the incarnation, mm -hmm. God taking human form, being like us in everything but sin, you know, it helps you. Like, God has revealed himself to us, we failed him, and he decided to say, okay, let my son come and take that human form. It could be a way of saying, let him come and be like them so that he can teach them much better. Mm -hmm. you know? Relatable. Right. Relatable. You, Absolutely. The way he acts and everything, this is what we're supposed to do. Mm -hmm. yeah. Let me teach you by doing it. That's what the American philosopher says, right? Mm -hmm. David G. Mm -hmm. John Dewey. Children learn by doing it. So let me teach them by doing it. Any other question? or insights or thoughts into God the Father, God the Son, or God the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit too is the sanctifier. sanctifier. Great. The third person of the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And um, you know, when you read most, most texts in scriptures, you hardly see texts that talk about Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. A few may refer to it, but they don't actually talk about it. For instance, when you read Genesis 1, 20, it says, let us make man in our own image. Who is us? Why were you speaking let us in plural? That is just an indication that it's a trinity. Or when Jesus Christ is baptized, and then the Holy Spirit came in the form of a dove, and then the Father speaks, and then the Son is there, that we are able to say, okay, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, right? Apart from that, most of the texts in Paul, we only talk of either Father and Holy Spirit, like I'm doing tonight, I didn't talk about the Son. <laughs> or Father and Son, or Son and Holy Spirit, you know, try, just two things. So it's a doctrine that developed with time, but does it mean that it wasn't there? No. But it just means that the grammar, let's say the grammar, or the understanding was not there. It develops with time, but the doctrine has been there. So the Holy Spirit, the sanctifier, is a paraclete. When we talk about when you after Easter, right? Fifty days after Easter, what do we celebrate? Fifty days after Easter. Pentecost, Pentecost. And it's all about the Holy Spirit, right? That the Holy Spirit, when Jesus Christ says, When I go back, then I'll send the advocate. The advocate comes now on Pentecost Sunday, which is the Holy Spirit. And he says when he comes, he will, say, he will teach you everything. So I mean, there was so much that Jesus Christ could not teach us, that he said, all right, the Holy Spirit will come and teach you. And the Holy Spirit becomes not the love between the Father and the Son, right? Does that, does that make sense? Yes, the Holy Spirit now becomes the love, the unity, the bond of <coughs> unity between the Father and the Son. It's not a tangible, we don't have any tangible thing about the Holy Spirit, right? We just feel the Spirit, right? Apart from the dove descending, descending like a dove, everything about the Holy Spirit, you know, it's just Spirit. Anything about the Holy Spirit is Spirit. So, at confirmation, we receive the Holy Spirit, and they say, receive the Holy Spirit and all His gifts. So, God the Father is the Creator, the Son, Redeemer, the Holy Spirit, the Sanctifier. And if you were to draw a triangle, a triangle, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, what will you put in the middle? Mm -hmm. Second? Second. A circle. Sure. A circle will do. But, um, is the love shared between the three? The love. The love. Yeah, the love shared between the three. That's what is holding them together, right? There's a love between the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So that's the Trinity, the doctrine of the Trinity. That there's one God in three persons. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Each, they have their distinct roles, but they consubstantial with one another. Any questions? Um, so you said for the Holy Spirit that it can be sent through um, 
can it be sent through as in human form? So like, let's say, you know, a couple weeks ago I felt some type of way and I needed to like hear something, like get a sign, right? Like when we're looking for signs mm -hmm. and like, let's say I run into somebody at church and randomly they're like, can I pray for you? Mm -hmm. Is that like the Holy Spirit being sent through somebody else? Is, sure. that, is that how it can work? Sure, that works, it works perfectly better. So would you say like, like intuition, is that kind of, is that in alignment with like the Holy Spirit or is that something mm -hmm. different? Intuition. Intuition, we, we deal more with knowledge, you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, you talk about stages of knowledge. Intuition will do more there, but the Holy Spirit will not really be, will not place it at the level of intuition, but it can give you insight to what the Holy Spirit is, but it will not really align with what exactly the Holy Spirit is. Yeah, it's much more than intuition. Okay. Yeah. And then... So is it more like your conscience guiding you to what God wants you to do, the Holy Spirit, or just guiding you in the principles how you should act, or... Yeah, it's yeah. much more than your conscience. Yeah. yeah, your conscience is the voice of God in man. So the Holy Spirit will inform the voice of God, which is in you. But you can also think of a badly formed conscience, will you mean? That is being the Holy Spirit. No, so the Holy Spirit is much more than that. It leads us in ways mm -hmm. than we can imagine. But it could walk in people, it could walk in events, it could walk in many ways to inspire you. Yeah. So it's the link, it's the spiritual link between us and God. And, yeah. and God the Father, Jesus the Redeemer, sure. and the Holy Spirit itself. So yeah. it's that spiritual thing. Yes, absolutely. So could I say, like, you know when people say, like, trust your gut, you know, like, you, you're, maybe you're walking down the street and you just can sense, like, something is around the corner and so you turn around. Is, I mean, some people might say that's your intuition, some people might say, well, that was my conscience, some people might say, that was my gut. <coughs> So is it something, something bigger than that, essentially? Yeah. Okay. It's God. It's God. Okay. Yeah. You have a question? Yeah, is it like in any way, is it have to be religious related um, all the time? Or like she was saying, can it be your gut? And then also how is it related to like, I don't know, what they call guardian angels? Sure. It will be all of that, <clears throat> but much more. I know we are lingering on the peripheries of analogies right now and you know every analogy is limited. Every analogy will not give us the full picture of who it is. But because it's a mystery, right? First, it's a mystery that we are talking that there are three persons in one God. How do you comprehend that? It's a mystery. Second, we are trying to understand it in human terms and it's just so much our mind can take us to. But uh, when all is said and done, if we get the best is that the Holy Spirit is a person of the Trinity, is God, is not that tangible, as just like God the Father. We only know God the Father through God the Son, right? We know He's a creator, but the Son is only that physical link between the Father and us to let us know, my Father, I have a Father, God the Father is a creator. Then we can now get to know that the Holy Spirit being the bond of unity between them would be much more than our analogies can take us, but far much more than our reasoning can let us go. I don't know if that makes any sense. It might be helpful just to remind everyone the gifts of the Holy Spirit, like, you know, knowledge, piety, wisdom, yep. fear of the Lord. So when, you, about, when you receive confirmation, you receive seven gifts of the Holy Spirit. And you I mean the few of them. I don't think I hit all knowledge, of them. wisdom, understanding, piety, counsel, counsel, yeah. fortitude, and the fear of the Lord. And all these gifts, they just show us how much the Holy Spirit can give us, right? And how much more we can delve into the depths of the Holy Spirit and not even get all of it. And they are fruits of the Holy Spirit as well. So there's so much that the Holy Spirit helps us in our faith, like understanding, knowledge, 
counsel, piety, you know, fortitude, courage, the fear of the Lord, not the type of fear that I fear the police on the road, but the kind of fatherly fear, you know, kind of cordial, respectful fear. So there's so much about the Holy Spirit that our rationality can only take us to a certain extent. Any other thoughts? So you mentioned earlier that uh, Jesus sent the Holy Spirit. He, he mentioned it. That he <laughs> he said, said, yeah. Right. He said, whenever I rise, I, later I will, I will send the Holy Spirit mm -hmm. to counsel you or to, to kind of help you spread the word. Yep. Right? Okay. Yeah. Right. Yeah, like he said, there's so much more to tell you that there will be too much for you. So when I go, I'll send the advocate. It becomes like your helper, the advocate, mm -hmm. your guide to help you design everything into yeah. So some denominations um, don't favor Trinity um, within Christianity. What is the official response to, you know, how do we keep Christianity as a, as a uh, united religion yeah, you know, we kind of have to have some response to put our differences aside, if you will. So what is, what is our official response to? So you said they don't favor the Trinity? Because, mm -hmm. you know, some, some say yep. it puts, um, it goes against the fact that there's only one God. So, and that is obviously some foundations in Christianity don't want to be <coughs> yes. Yeah, I think... A couple of thoughts, and the first is, they just refuse the term, right? Yeah. Because they talk about the Father, Jesus Christ, oh sure, Holy Spirit, sure. So, what are they just not following? It's just a matter of terminology that you say, because you say it's a trinity, one God in three persons. Probably their vocabulary doesn't lead them to understand how that is possible. But they talk about it, but they just don't want to align with the terminology that there are three persons in one God. Secondly, they, are, they think maybe we talk of and about three gods, which is a misconception, right? So it stems sometimes from biases to not understanding actually what it is. But they actually profess the same thing. They, they, are, they may have so much emphasis on the Holy Spirit, on the Spirit, or on the Father, but in all, most, most religions, they talk about the Father, they talk about the Son, they talk about the Holy Spirit. Islam, for instance, they will talk about Jesus Christ as a prophet. Also, we talk of Jesus Christ as God. But you see that they talk about it, but it's just a terminology which they don't accept with us. I think. Any other? What I just need to understand about the Holy Spirit is that, like, we have we have those visuals of, like, okay, the Father in picture, you know, like the the, the, the guy in the robes, you know, with the, <laughs> on the throne, and then there's like the Son, okay, and, like, a man, yes, you yeah, know, yeah. and then like the Holy Spirit, just like this vague sparkly, omnipresent stuff, you know, and I think that's Absolutely. the confusion. It's like, well, what is it? How does that manifest in the world? And it's like, yeah. it's, it's a feeling. It's things, the invisible thing we can't see. You know, exactly. But it appeared after Jesus died. So it's almost like, just, is that, is the Holy Spirit what Jesus manifests? Is that, is it Jesus manifesting as the Holy Spirit, like, to continue to talk to us? Or, are, I mean, like, are they still separate, completely free things? I mean, or is that... Yeah, so the three, the three God, the three persons and one God, they all act as one, right? There is that bond of unity among them. And you won't say the Father is the Son. The Father is not the Son, and the Son is not the Father. Nor is the Son the Holy Spirit, or the Holy Spirit the Son. So they all have their distinct roles. But then, when Jesus Christ says he's going to send the Advocate, which is the Holy Spirit, it's not a replacement of Jesus, but like it says, an advocate coming to, you know, to teach us everything.
to help us to be able to, you know, to comprehend, to understand what exactly that mystery is. But it doesn't come to the place Jesus or to the coming of the Holy Spirit is not the is not means we did it Jesus Christ. I don't know, does that make sense? <laughs> yeah. Um so in Luke, um there's a passage in here about um the Holy Spirit coming down um, upon Mary. So to answer your question, if they're reading the Bible, it's actually in there. So uh, oh, that was actually my next question. Okay. Well, <laughs> yeah. I was I was a half a step ahead of it. No, that's but anyway, right. yeah, yes. So yeah, I guess it's interpretations if they want to relation. Okay. Um, it could be like question. um like uh, Thomas Jefferson. He wrote his own Bible because he didn't believe that um, in, in the miracle portions. So he just erased all those and he kept the portion where uh, Jesus did other things other than in, you know, preaching, but not. Um, so I guess if you want to do that, you can write your own Bible. <laughs> okay. so, I guess question about that. So the territory is not mentioned in the Bible. Right? Yeah, sure. Would it be helpful to kind of like keep the faith united if the word was actually the time was mentioned in the Bible? That way, you know, there wouldn't be all these like yes, so theories and the denominations kind of like. Given that the Bible is the word of God written under the inspiration, so it's difficult to just add the term. And like I said, there is no, the doctrine of the Trinity developed over time, you know, the doctrine of the Trinity has been there from the beginning, but the vocabulary was not there. And then when you look at the councils in the church, the, early, the councils in the early church, it was, it led to several debates to come up with where, to where we were, to that interpretation. So the doctrine is there, is not that visible until the vocabulary for it is developed. So adding the word Trinity, for instance, will just be all right, our own addition to what is considered as the inspired word of God. But interpreting it to mean that it is horizontally valid and it is not going against inspiration. Isn't that inspiration itself? kind of proof of the Holy Spirit, like the demonstration of the Holy Spirit. You know, um, when Jesus says that the Holy Spirit will come down and he will teach you everything, we're still living in that age where the Holy Spirit is revealing, continuously revealing. So that is the magisterium, right? That is the continuing revelation of God right. by God. Yeah, it's a continuous revelation, but then the fullness of revelation was written yeah, yeah. in Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. So Jesus Christ, like the letter to Hebrews says, is the fullness of revelation. So now the majesty, every other thing can be an interpretation of the teaching office, but it's no longer, there's no longer again any new revelation or any, because the fullness of it was in Christ. Just to understand. Yeah, I, I, um, the uh, Trinity is not necessarily easily understood. Uh, as in, or nor easily explain uh, as a lifelong Catholic I'm um, still learning about the Trinity uh, at different times in my life um, I bring me closer to God the Father or I might be relating more to Jesus the Son and it's a lifelong process it's not really like a lecture you can hear about the Trinity and you oh I, I got it I'm going to go home now and write some notes uh, I think it's a it is uh, a mystery that is um, we learn about as we continue through our faith. Yeah. Um, a few years back, Rich and I <clears throat> went to Peru uh, to see our son who was down there and went through a lot of museums. And they were, so the Peru um, was the Christianity, Catholicism was brought to Peru in like the 1500s, 1400s, 1500s. They have a lot of artwork from that period of time. We went to this one museum. And they were, from this picture, 
they're obviously trying to explain the Trinity to the native Peruvians and to the, to the Indians and everything there. And what struck us, and still I remember it to this day, is three images of Jesus the Son at like the, the ta at a, a table which would be the, uh, it was the Last Supper table. So it would be three Jesuses there at the Last Supper. And they had another picture of three Jesuses doing something else. So they were trying to explain three gods in one person, all of which looked like Jesus. But that was their trying to get across the Trinity to the native people. This is what we're talking about, the three gods in one person. I've never seen that before. That is a really interesting concept of how to try to explain this to people. That said, any other questions? Oh, this is one more question about the Holy Spirit. Uh, with regards to the Holy Spirit in the Bible, I know, forget what it is, but the, actually manifested onto the apostles. Um, there's a painting of it with the, I guess, the flames above their heads. Um, they said that they spoke in many languages. Would that be a manifestation of the Holy Spirit? These people that just don't know how to speak any of these languages, and they certainly are reading these languages. Now we have to written in the Bible, so somebody witnessed it. Yes, so I have many reservations on that. It's just me. I've seen where people say, come, let me teach you how to speak in tongues. Those people were not taught how to speak in tongues. It was actually the Holy Spirit that led them to speak. And those tongues were languages that people understood, right? But today, you could hear people speaking in languages that don't exist. Probably they are forming their own languages, which is easy to make up things right than to speak for any. It's more easy for me to just mix things. Not that we are confusing the work of the Holy Spirit, but truly it's possible that the Holy Spirit could still come to us like that same Pentecost and we speak in tongues or in languages other than our own, but we have never been taught, but not negating that fact, it could happen, but the, how often it does, compared to the increasing number of prophets and men and women of God we have who are preaching on the streets, I think it's highly debatable. 